Hey everybody, welcome to Dave's Brick House. Today I have a guest with me live in the studio, Caleb Inman. He's graciously agreed to come on and hang out with me for a bit. We're gonna learn more about him and then we have some really cool stuff that he's gonna show us later on in the video. So make sure you hang out for that. So let's start, uh, let's find out a little bit about you, Caleb. How, how, when did you get into Lego? That's a great question. I, so I'm currently 26. I believe I got into Lego around 12 or 13 and it's funny. So I grew up in a house where um, my, uh, Mom wasn't especially fond of Lego because when we were young, we had some grandparent gifts, and I think young, probably four or five, and that resulted in frustration and tears on the part of the kids because Lego, if you have really stubby little hands and inexperienced with it, is uh, it's pretty easy to hurt yourself, and also things just fall apart if they're not pressed together well. And that's something that I've seen a lot with younger builders is pressing parts together is challenging. Yep. Um, and so that resulted in mom being like, okay, that isn't a toy that we need in the house right now. You guys aren't mature enough for it, uh, which was pretty funny, but it actually worked great. So what happened was we had a lot of the, are you familiar with connects? Yes. And that's what I grew up with from probably as when I was very young until about eight or nine when we started getting connects bricks. And um, so that was connects attempting to do a Lego compatible uh, thing that could be constructed and I think there was also ways to connect that to the regular connects like um, lattice and bar parts but uh, we started uh, my brother and I would start playing with the connects bricks more than the connects and so mom realized that we were about ready, ready for, for Lego Lego yep. yeah um, and what I was starting I was getting to the point where my engineering brain was beginning to turn on and I was like these aren't high enough tolerance for me there's too much slop and it was funny that I started to the, understand the the concepts scene? like that. Yeah, the yeah. Kinex bricks. Yep. Yep. Um, and so I um, asked for a couple Lego sets. And I got one from um, one of my aunts whose kids would receive Lego sets but then never build them. So she just started shipping them all to Ooh, Oregon. That's nice. Yeah. Um, didn't get too many from them, but it was enough to kickstart me. So I remember um, my some of my family was in New York and I didn't get to go on that trip. It was actually for a Kinex. My um, older brother won a Kinex competition. And... Um, I think he won that twice, um, but he went to New York this time to go to the a Connects factory and then go see a new Connects being unveiled in some tower in New York. So I didn't get to go on that trip because there wasn't um, we didn't want to take the whole family. But over that trip, um, I built the original UCS Lego Batmobile, and that was the like instantaneous transition for me between Connects and Lego. And so it was kind of funny because my brother kept building connects until he just started getting other hobbies. Um, and I went straight down into the, the, the Lego deep dive. So my very first set was, um, well, besides that one, the first set that I purchased with my own money, um, I remember, I think I, that was at Target, uh, was a bucket truck from City probably about 15 years ago. Oh yeah, those are cool um, sets. And I still like a lot of the City sets. Absolutely. City's one of the most consistent in terms of play value yeah um but that bucket truck was amazing then the other one was a christmas present i got that year from my older brother which was um, it was like a four dollar little uh barbecue stand set with a chef guy oh nice with just a little pop-up thing and it had a hot dog and a ketchup mustard and that is still my favorite set <laughs> because it's so specific and i buy it like every time i ever see it so <laughs> I'm, I'm growing a small collection of <laughs> that's just great unopened um new and packaged that's great. Barbecue stands. Back to one thing you were saying about tolerance. That I still get. I'm amazed at how you can take a piece. I mean, I I bought way too much Lego. Just for, for your benefit, the people on my channel already know this. But I only got into Lego in like late 2019. I never did it as a oh, kid. Cool. And I'm 64 now. So yeah. that was like what five years ago. Um, but I w went into what I call um, accelerated a fall mode, where I was just buying stuff left and right. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of stuff bulk bulk buys off of Facebook and places like that. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of old Lego. But it's amazing how. You can take a Lego brick, some of which you can tell are really old because if you're not careful, they'll break, yeah. especially the blues and the browns. Yep. But you take one of those and you put it on one that was made, you know, this year that I got off the pick a brick wall and, and they still fit just fine. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I think that's probably the thing that the original um, Lego designer, was that Ole Kirk Christian? Yeah, I think so. Um, he nailed the concept that having a specifically patented high tolerance um, with that inner tube, I know that was kind of the game changer for Lego bricks at the time, but that would be a success. And making modularity from the very start of the Lego franchise to the end be the, the primary goal. I think did what no other toy company at the time knew how to do yep. and was definitely a good decision. So it's kind of funny how we got so locked into that, you know, that dimension, roughly 1.25 inches per four studs. I know that's not quite exact. I think it's metric is the exact. Yeah. Number, I don't remember but, exactly what the number uh, is, but yeah. But it's like, it's funny that 
however he said it that back then is exactly how we still have it today and that's how we'll have it forever so if we ever wanted to adjust but a little too late for that module x tried yep. and failed <laughs> yep yep so what kind of things do you like to build do you mostly do mocks or do you do sets on occasion or great question so um i really quickly started wanting to do mocks i think when we grew up with connects actually that probably helped the fact that i grew up with connects because the connect sets were so uh, they weren't really designed with the intent that you build what the box shows. Um, they were intended to feed a collection of parts and build whatever you want. Okay. My brother being part of the Kinex, um competitions, obviously that requires custom building. And that competition mindset, which I find funny how few hobbies there are that have this sort of international like competition sort of thing. That people just are like, hey, let's go have a, a Lego contest. Like... Maybe art contests exist, but there probably aren't reading contests or like, I don't know, book rebinding contests. I mean, I, it just, I find it so funny that Lego hobbies specifically um, and other things very similar to it have this contest focus. Anyway, because of that, I, uh, because I was accustomed to the, the Connects contest, I started to submit to the monthly um, Lego magazine contest. And so that's where I started creating mocks. And I still have a few things. I should have brought them with me, but they're some of my earliest creations. I remember one of the things that I made, which... I have such bad memories of that I feel like I must have dreamt it, but I'm pretty sure I didn't. Hopefully I can find photos of my parents at some point. But I was still around that age. It was probably within that first year of my Lego hobby, 10 or 11. Um, I built a construction site with, I uh, just made a bunch of different um, Lego, uh, like, you know, dump trucks, cranes, um, backhoes, partially constructed buildings and things. Nice. And I still have one of the backhoes and one of the front end loaders that I created, which are pretty decent. I mean, they would pretty much fit in any creator set. I, I think it's funny how I feel like my talent jumped up when I first started in the hobby and then has been pretty constant ever since then. I found it very hard to actually get any better, but maybe that's a different conversation. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I know how that goes. I mean, I, I look back at one of the very first mocks I did and I'm going, it's not very good, but I show it to other people and I go, wow, wait, what? That was your first mock? Yeah, exactly. You know, but then I look at the later ones and like, oh, they have a little more detail, but they're not that much better. Although yeah. internally I've learned a lot about techniques and yeah, and maybe they get more polished, but um, yeah. so anyway, uh, I'm not saying I am a great builder. I consider myself a very mediocre builder, but I feel like I've been mediocre since the very beginning. Before so. I forget, <laughs> I have to say something else about that. And this this goes not just for Lego, but for all kinds of things. I always consider myself a mediocre builder, and other people look at my stuff and go, but even like Moto, do you know who Moto is? Yeah. Even Moto, Moto and I are friends now, and he said, your stuff is amazing. And yeah. I said, so is yours. And he said, mine's not amazing. And he said, well, I can't do buildings. <laughs> You know, so yeah, we, we tend to be our own worst Absolutely. enemy, our worst yeah. critic, I should say. Yeah. So um, anyway, but you asked about things that I like and enjoy building. So um, the first thing that I ever built that I consider like my first real true mock, well, actually there were two of them. One was a um, LDD, like a digital designer guitar that was to scale that I submitted to um, Ideas. So right after Kuso transitioned to Ideas, they changed the age limit from 18 to uh, 13. Oh, I didn't know that. And that was the same year that I turned 13. Okay. And so I had been like wishing that I could get older qu quicker so that I could join Lego Kuso <laughs> and start posting. Because for whatever reason, that was the first um, online Lego outlet I found. I guess it's because I transitioned from the um, Lego magazine contests to another officially published Lego contest that, I, um, that was Kuso. And then it took me another year later or so to find mock pages and start making friends there. Mock pages um, isn't there anymore, is it? Mock pages, I don't think even exists anymore. Yeah, it was having server trouble as of 2018. Yeah. yeah. I'm anyway, sorry you never sorry, got to experience going. Yeah, yeah. I tried to look at it and it was That was the by best. The time I went to look for it, everybody said it was great. In my opinion, I'm from that era, but that was the best method of sharing creations in the Lego hobby. Um, it was written on a terrible coding base, but it had the ability to post multiple pictures, post a description, very streamlined, and not at all the um, like instant satisfaction that all current social media is built around. Yeah. So it was much better tailored to archival um, creation from both a visual perspective and a verbal perspective. So. Yeah, but I, sorry, I kind of interrupted you. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure where you were going <laughs> no with problem. the mock pages. So but. the second thing that I built was a... Um, I stayed on LDD for quite a while because my collection was pretty small at first. And for I, that was the same era where I started to like be like, ooh, I want to be a, a CAD designer when I grow up. Um, which... I don't want to be, and <laughs> I am really glad that my work is a bit more interesting than that, but uh, I built an 18,000 piece, um, super accurate model of Cloud City. In LDD? a full interior. How, yeah. what, at what age? I was 13 and a half. Okay, that's impressive. That. Yeah, um, and that one's pretty good. I mean, it could use some polish if I went back to it, but I included every single scene from the movie 
in a, it's hard to describe, I wish I had some images to show. Maybe I can link you to it and you can. Yeah, if we get some later, I'll add him as B-roll to the video, yeah. Um, so I, it's about three and a half feet in diameter, but the, the two things that I wanted to get were, first of all, have a full interior that included every scene from the, the movie, um, Empire Strikes Back, and two, I wanted the exterior, all the angles to be perfect. And so um, I did a bunch of wedges overlapping each other. Actually, when Captain America's Shield came out like a year ago, I saw that mm -hmm. and was like, I think I could probably redo Cloud City using that technique. So it's like the first time in the last 10 years that I felt like there's a possibility I could go back to that build and actually make it yeah. um, physically possible. Because that was a thing. No way this could be built in real life. Um, it wouldn't hold itself together. And I built it like with these oh, ideas yeah. of being, you could pull the bottom off and put it on stands. Um, so it, it looks really cool in the renderings. But uh, it, it would it would have taken a Lego designer quite a bit of effort to turn it into a set. So anyway, that was that was where I started meeting people in the Lego hobby, and so that's where I initially met. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Sad Fan or Car Creator. I think 2013's tag. I might get that wrong, but he was the one who created the Saturn V. Um, oh, rocket. Okay. And so he and I um, talked a lot, and I hung out with him and a couple other friends, and so uh, he was one of my very earliest and first um, contacts in the Lego community. Also, Umbermanis, who's currently part of the... Um, I can pull it up. It's on my phone. It's a digital building uh, Discord group. Nice. And, um, he and Sabfan have been running that for the last several years. But um, So there are some of my first friends. Then I went over to Mock Pages and met a lot of local guys. So Kevin Warner, um, Doug Hughes, uh, Timothy Shortell, Jake... I forget what Jake's last name is. Sorry, Jake. Uh... I forget what his last name is. Mountain too. Hobbit. Yeah. Uh, and then probably Eli Wilsey and Grant, Grant Davis. Yeah. And, yeah. So anyway, met a lot of good guys. And so we've had a kind of a um, little informal um, a Discord group that we call a, it's not a lug, but it's like a, you know, quote, quote lug. Uh, so we called it Radica Lug. And we've built uh, a lot of collaborations. Brought nice. Bricks Cascade the last almost decade. Well, along those lines, you know, I live outside of Portland um, and Bricks Cascade is my home convention and I'm a member of Port Lug. And I don't, I can't compare it to anywhere else, but the Lego community here is really vibrant and we have so it many is. amazing it's builders. weird, but it's amazing. Yeah. Show up, you know, and we've had like, <laughs> Boone is now a Lego designer. Boone was in our lug and it, I became yep. good friends with him. And I think that's how I got hooked in with so many other people and maybe even how I got involved with the Creations for Charity stream, which we'll get to in a little bit, I promise. Oh yeah, we're getting there, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Boone and then who else did we have? We had, um, uh, I'm, oh, Blair just became a Lego mm -hmm. designer, and we've had a number number of other people. Yeah, and we just we and and the lug we we typically have the last like four or five months we've had fifty over fifty people at each of our meetings. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really cool to hear that that's thriving. I probably need to look into joining a local lug. Yeah, I don't know what there point. is down there, but you can there's a there's like a the the land the Lego Ambassador Network site has a place where you can go find lugs near you. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's one in Corvallis. Uh, there might be. I don't think Oregon has that much. Similarly to the Lego store, I think there's only one, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I'll by, by the way, this is an interesting <laughs> little piece of trivia that I learned at our last lug meeting. Um, our Lego store here at Washington Square is tiny. It's the only store in Oregon, and yet it is in the top five for the pick-a-brick wall sales in the whole country. Actually, it's number two. The only store wow. ahead of us is Disney Anaheim. Wow. And we're in the top 10 for sales. If you take out the, the, the flagship stores, we're like in the top five for sales. And we were like a few years ago as well. So again, we have a vibrant Lego community here. So you mean there's actually enough demand that they could build a second store? <laughs> yeah, could, there, there's like three in Washington and there's only one here. I know, at I least know. three in Washington. There's three within 45 minutes in Washington. Yeah, you'd think there might be mind. one down in Salem yeah. or Eugene or something, but I guess there isn't. So. I did an internship up at Seattle or in um, Everett and it was so nice being able to be like, I want some stuff and then just do a circuit and then an hour where I hit three Lego stores. Yeah, I still need to go up to those. I haven't been at, oh, I'm going to go visit a friend in Seattle here in a couple of days. Maybe I'll try to do that. It's worth it. Yeah. yeah might as well at least get the Linwood one. Anyway, we, I'm having a great time. We're kind of getting off track though. Yeah. Back to what do you like Things I like building. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'll say what motivates me. For whatever reason, the only thing that really seems to motivate me to build these days is collaboratives. So I pretty much will build whatever the heck somebody is building in a collaborative environment. Um, and that's been either with the Radical Lug group or it's been with Rebel Lug, who I'm currently a member of. Um, Rebel Lug is amazing, so, some of the stuff they do. Yeah, it's a great group of people. Uh, so that is honestly the only thing that I think I've voluntarily built for the last few years. Maybe I could add contest to that. I know I participated in, or at least attempted to throw my hat into the ring for Vig Week, and then um, Iron Forge, maybe. Might have been Iron Forge. Um, but... 
yeah, I, I don't really build much for pleasure right now or just things I want to build. It takes a while. Actually, very just I, I built a Christmas gift and actually I, I do do things like that. I'll spend too much time building Christmas gifts. I agree with you on collaboratives. I'm <clears throat> actively involved with the Jurassic Park collab at Bricks Cascade, which is huge. There's like, I don't know, 15 of us now. And it's one whole quadrant of the thing. It just keeps getting bigger every year. Yeah. If we get, get more space, we probably can make it even bigger. And then I'm a uh, theme coordinator, one, I should say co-theme coordinator for the post apoc theme at Bricks Cascade. Yeah. And we've had this bunker built. I think I had forgotten. So I'll, I'm going to sidetrack on that for a minute. And I'll, I'll put a link to the, some of the bunker videos that Beyond the Brick did. They're really cool. But that, that thing has just gone crazy. People love it. And I'm having a blast with it. And that is the, the ultimate collab because, like, I think the second year we had like forty people contributing a hundred bunkers, and that's cool. Yeah, it just keeps going. Amazing, up. but it's amazing for the uh, the uh, I guess media reference value. It's so easy to build a bunker that's like a Gru and Minions bunker, yep, or a Marvel Hangout Lounge bunker. Or I'm just making this up. Grab some parts from your friends and make a Hulk bunker. Yeah, who would do that? Oh wait, that like was you. <laughs> That was the one that didn't have any sides, right? It was just Hulk holding up yeah, to what was above Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is what everything 16 by 16 was like a yep. um, format. Yeah, so 13 bricks high, 13 bricks 16 high. by 16 sides. Yeah, um, so I thought it'd be funny to uh, not actually build a bunker, just build a character. So that gets that answers the second half of this question. What do I actually like building? My favorite thing to build is still um, character-related builds, uh, whether it's a portrait or a small, full like model of an actual creature. So I created Hulk just in this like crouching position. Similar to, there's some Greek god that like holds up the world. Oh yeah, 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 I don't remember and who that is. That's but... kind of what I was trying to emulate. So Hulk's like down on one knee, he's wearing purple shorts. But I built all of this using all the random like bulk parts that Grant Davis brings to Vix Cascade every single year because he always finishes his Lego models the day before the hall opens. And so I was like, hey, can I borrow some parts? So um, that was, you sort of have to make up fun things to do during the day of the convention, and that was one of the most fun things. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 because I was so involved with other things, I wasn't active with the, the, the bunker part. My friend Rob Willing was the bunker master and has been for the last few years. But he was telling me that, yeah, somebody just kind of brought this in overnight. Was that true? You built it on site? And, oh, yeah. yeah. It took me a couple hours yeah. to put it together. And we always love those. I mean, it's interesting because Rob's the one who has to Tetris this all together to make sure they all fit. <laughs> but it's always fun to get builds overnight as long as they're to the spec, then... Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's pretty great. And actually, that's one of the biggest things that I think collaboratives are realizing is that A, you, you can have a ton of people in a collab if B, you create a good um, spec for it. So I know city layouts, micro scale modular city layouts have always followed a sort of template, but um, New Hashima is That's a the great one I was going to mention that. that yeah, yeah, we actually had somebody in our lug meeting two months ago that was part of that that brought us a module, which was very cool. But that's that is cool. one of the most amazing. I think that's the longest video I've ever seen from Beyond the Yeah, Break. absolutely. It was like a two and a half hour tour, I think. Absolutely. That was at Brickworld Chicago, which is the first time I went was this year. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And so I, was, I kept watching. He's like, why are they over? They're still shooting. Why are they still shooting? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. I didn't know what it was yet because I was hanging out with some other friends and then, wow. Yeah. I don't know if I ran into you, but that was the first year I went to Brick's. Uh, Brick World Chicago as well. Oh, that's funny. Um, specifically because I was contributing to the... Okay, the that makes sense. I took a cube in a, a very small uh, tower. Um, and I only got to stay until Friday because I had to leave for a wedding in Seattle ah. on Saturday. But it was a really good experience. So, yeah. And for anybody who might hear in the background, if you hear Micah screaming, that's that's my macaw downstairs. I've talked to him about him on the on the stream before. And he's, he's a little jealous that we're up here without him. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's the way it is. And on that note, let's, let's pivot a little bit to the next reason that we're here. Um, what brings... You here was, um, so every year, there's, well, there's a, a charity called Creations for Charity that does stuff throughout the year. And honestly, I don't know that much about what they do throughout the year, but I know that they're focused on getting uh, Lego sets done to people's children. I think that's right. Yeah. And exactly. uh, every year beyond the brick, well, this has been the, the 10th year. At, right after Thanksgiving, they do a 24-hour live stream. And I've been involved with that for the last four years. And it's always tons and tons of fun. You get all kinds of people, you get Lego designers, you get people all over the world since it's running for 24 hours. And this year, we had a number of people generously contributing mocks that they had done. Um, I think there was at least 10 of them. I don't. I kind of lost track, and I wasn't watching Probably for the whole 24 hours, but there was yeah. quite a few. And this gentleman here was one of the guys that built some mocks. Um, and what they did is they put them up for auction, and um, just over I think maybe a 30-minute period, they let people put in bids, and whoever won... There you go. And I ended up winning a bid for an auction that Caleb built. It is really, really cool. You'll see it here in a minute. I mean, it, it, it has a real organic feel to it. And then the colors that you chose are some of my favorite colors. That's so that awesome. really nice. Um, but I want to talk a little bit, and we'll see if we can get some footage of this later. I want to talk a little bit, if we can, about the other thing you contributed. Because yeah. that was amazing. The antenna art. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, this kind of falls in the line with me enjoying building uh, character builds. So my very first creation I ever submitted to Creations for Charity. I wish I knew what year it was, but what is it right now? 23? So it might have been 2014 or 2015, I want to guess. Um, I, I dabbled in a new uh, art form with Lego, which I have just dubbed antenna art, although lever art is probably a more accurate term, where I use a solitary element and try to create an entire picture with it. Essentially the same thing as pixel art, except what I'm doing is, um, if you've ever seen a uh, like a, a vector field where there's just a bunch of little lines pointing in a certain direction, mm -hmm. I find that like really alluring art. I also absolutely love line art, um, but I'm taking it a little differently where I take every antenna and I just point it in a different direction to convey a little bit of a um, angle or an edge. And then together with a 48 by 48 base plate, you put a couple thousand antennas down on the on the platform and you start to see this shape that really um, t takes form. And what I like about it versus pixel art, with pixel art, there's no defined direction uh, to the pixels. You have to back up quite a bit before you can start to actually see the image because it coalesces and everything turns into a small dot. But instead of having a dot, I use an act a bunch of little lines that point in different directions. And the scope of it is you can see waves and hair and you can see the bridge of a nose and you can see uh, a collar and wrinkles on a shirt. And so I haven't done nearly as much of this art form as I want to. I really hope that in a couple Bricks Cascades from now, I can bring 10 or 15 of these to a convention and just wow. have my own little showcase. <laughs> Before I forget, did, where did you get 20,000, not 20,000, 2,000 levers? Did you, that, was that I, I've been stocking up on them. So they had them on the Pricker Brick wall a few years back. Um, but what I really want to do is stock up on more of the alternate color ones. So uh, if there is a photo that gets posted, it's a light gray, a light blade background um, for the base plate with um, the, the light blade base and the black lever. But um, I have a small but growing collection of white base and black lever, and those are harder to work with because of much higher contrast if you have a white background and a black lever. Yeah. And so you don't have as much natural shadow, so it's very, it's a lot more glaring in terms of where the lines are. So I'm also hoping that I can collect some white base gray lever, but those are much more expensive and hard to get a hold of. Um, but that would allow me to create a lot more subtle effects. I thought the base plate that you used for the, the auction this year was a white. It was it was like yeah so it might have oh, looked, it was light gray it might have looked white okay. on camera it's always hard to like. tell on the streams because the, the the compression yeah. is you know absolutely and everybody's really camera's a little bit but I thought the contrast looked really good the black levers against the gray it still works really good. well and yeah. that's why I actually haven't done a white one yet a white base but I'm nervous when I do I'm sure it will be a lot more obvious and harder to get what I'm going for but yeah to build those it's kind of weird I feel like I get into this very zen state it's easily the most relaxing of any Lego creation that I do and I just have my reference image next to me and I put the um the base plate down and I just start placing things. I can't even describe the process, but that one took me about two hours. Like that's, that's the it? trade secret. They don't take very long. Wow. I built that on site at Bricks Cascade. It might have also been last year. Wait, really? Two years ago. Same year I made the Hulk Buster. Wow. Or the, the, okay. the Hulk. I yeah. Think that was yeah, I think that was two years ago. I think were you there last year? No, no I wasn't. You were, you no, I was on the honeymoon. So it was two yeah. years ago, yeah. Yeah. So I uh, again took Brit Grant's brick collection and created a little easel for myself and set up the the plate and just placed levers for two hours wow. with, with people walking around. <laughs> wow. A bunch of people asked me what I was well, doing. Well yeah, that's actually kinda cool. It, it was be fun. a crowd man. I felt like I was like an artist, yeah, like yeah. Bob Ross doing a masterpiece or something while people are talking to him. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Anyway, I um, absolutely love that art form and I'm hoping that I can do it more to actually uh, show the world uh, what is capable of something as simple as a single piece artwork. Well, yeah, that, that part is cool, the fact that you're using a single piece. But also, when you said you were going to do 10 or 15 of them, like, how long is that going to take? Well, I guess with Trade Secret out, not as long yeah, as I thought. Yeah, not as long as you thought, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I have to be in a really specific mental state, though. So, you know, nine days out of 10, I definitely wouldn't be able to have the yep. the focus and um, mind presence. I think it's that way for a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, yeah, I've been working on, uh, well, that's another story, but I, I got a mock that I've been working on on and off for four years that hopefully is going to be finished here real soon. Wink, wink. <laughs> um, that I can show you guys. But uh, anyway, so let's uh, let's go ahead and see what you have for us here in this box. So, um, to all of the uh, viewers and watchers, this was originally going to go in the mail, so I packaged it up very well. And this, uh, I decided I just give Dave the full unpacking experience. But it turns out I live an hour away. So yeah, that was really convenient when I yeah when I emailed him, he said, "Hey, can I bring it bring it in person and also be in the video?" And I went, "Yeah, that'd be great." Now the first thing I want to show you is something I'm pretty excited about. I was uh, on a BrickLink store um, getting some other parts and I stumbled across something that made me extremely excited. So my online uh, tag is, I have a few different tags. Um, my main Lego tag has been VA Designs. That's actually 
So the VA comes from my uh, Star Wars character I created for myself back when I was a young kid. I was wondering what that was. Yeah, Verticus Akron. Uh, okay. And, and so I turned almost all of my online profiles after just the initials VA, or V Akron is how I actually started on mo uh, mock pages. And VA design seems a bit more appropriate for a uh, company or brand for sure. producing yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. But my gamer tag is um, Vakataka or Vakataka, V-A-K-A-T-T-A-K-A, -A -A -A, which you've seen on Discord. Yes, exactly. Yep. And turns out... There's a VAC tile. Oh, you're kidding me. It's a module X tile. Seriously? So V-A-K for, oh, I wow. forget the word, but it's the first three letters of the Dutch word vacation. And it's one of a very small number of uh, tiles that have printing on them, the module X system. But I found these and I'm like, there's a VAC tile? Wow. So I bought every single listing on Bricklink. So no one else can <laughs> have them Of course you now. did. So, you yeah. have the world supply. I, I, and I'm the only person who would care. I, that, it's like, exactly. There is one demand for this part yeah. but now i've got a bunch of teal and a bunch of green so i created this in case you're interested we can put it on the base and it'll like be a signature oh yeah mark. that's very cool so. yeah and i'm going to try to get uh, b-roll of a lot of these things here after the video so hopefully by the time you see this there'll okay. be better shots would you like to open it sure do the honors oh this side up i'm going to say that looks like the box is upside down but good thing you like it oh that's well taped again before you knew yeah. where it was going <laughs> i was expecting us to go cross country in lego models I've improved on that experience. So I don't think I finished what I was mentioning earlier. The first thing I ever submitted to Creations for Charity was a uh, antenna art portrait of Tarkin. Oh, nice. And so it was kind of fun being able to come full circle and create and sell a portrait of Obi-Wan Kenobi this time. That's interesting. Where'd you get that stuff from? Joanne. Oh, okay. yeah. That's, that's good to know. So there might be a little bit of dust. I don't know if you have any compressed air, but or just a way to blow it off. I. That was the one downside to. I don't want to. Oh, you see? Yeah, I get Would you like me to help you know that since yeah, I'm here? Yeah, because I don't want to take. Yeah, I already knocked the piece off. This is the uh, the full um, traditional Caleb method of packaging Lego creations. So I like to make sure everything is very stable. And there's this is such a weird shape that it was really hard to uh, to package it without allowing. Um, you know all the gaps to rattle around in there. So you but custom I think this cut all these. Pretty well. That's yeah, fantastic. It took, it took a little while, but I'm gonna have to go look totally for this at Joanne's. This is useful. It's not as cheap as I expected, so I've got a giant block in case you ever need a small amount. Okay, but I'm slowly unveiling what's inside there. So I kind of just made like a little pocket for every single little section in there, and it's I designed it to be modular, um, so it's very easy to pull it apart into sections. So oh, nice. And you can see there's a lot of purple in there, which is what I was alluding to. That's one of my favorite colors. Yep. In Lego, my favorite colors are dark green and dark tan because they just work for everything. But in general, I love purple. So there's the midsection. Um, <laughs> that actually is easier to blow off than I was worried it would be. Uh, there's the head. Is this your primary camera? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see. There be the tail. <laughs> And so those just slide together. I'm sure you can figure out how to connect those. Yep. And not too much has fallen off. As I say that, I hear a rattle noise. <laughs> yeah, there must be a piece. Yep. <laughs> At least a few pieces that are missing. That doesn't go there. So, um, crud. okay, yeah, it's like that. You can tell based on the orientation of the seahorses. So. That's where the head goes, but there's another piece we're going to add before that, and then the, you this can goes plug to the bottom yeah. in right there. Which reminds me, uh, we can talk about this more in a minute when we're when you're done unpacking. But when you were talking about this on the stream, it oh, dang it, it sounded like you either have some knowledge of, or a passion for, or a little of both of uh, sea sea type stuff. Is that true? Code oh sea um, like, ocean like ocean yeah the. To some degree, I will say, um, first of all, going to aquariums is amazing and one of my favorite, like, you know, zoo-related places to go. Just, I love seeing sea creatures in their natural environment or pseudo-natural environment. But seahorses have always been my favorite sea animal because they're just such a strange shape and have such a interesting um, anatomy and, yeah, I find them fascinating creatures. But this collab... This, this was actually a collab. Oh, I, I decided to create a collaborative for, um, uh, I just forgot the name, Creations for Charity in 2022. So five builders, including myself, built creations that were based on a theme of, they were an animal mech piloted by the animal designed to fight back against human encroachment into their natural habitat. 
So we had a wolf mech that was designed to run really fast in like combat deforestation. And there was a uh, duck mech that was designed to combat pollution of um, natural water environments. This seahorse mech was designed to uh, fight back against um, seahorses that get entangled in fishing nets meant for fish, not seahorses. And there was also an owl. I think deforestation is a similar concept there. And I will probably come up with a fifth one. I feel terrible. I can't remember. Um, but that was fun because I actually got some people who normally wouldn't have contributed to Creations for Charity to, to make a creation. So I'm hoping I can do that every year in the future. Yeah, that's actually get, a really neat get idea. Some folks together. And it may be similar to what you were saying where, you know, you, these days you don't really build on your own, but you build if you're part of a co That's Exactly. They're, they're, <laughs> back, back to that for a minute. I mean, not only is the, the Jurassic Park thing, it's what we do is amazing, but just... The, the the people and the social aspects of aspects of a collab. You learn so much. You're working with really fun people. Yeah, it really motivates me anyway to build. Wow, <laughs> a and little bit dusty. Sorry, that's all right. <laughs> While I like uh, building and it's very zen experience, it's not something that I will normally um, voluntarily go do. And so, the I, I feel like collaboratives are two things for me. One, it's uh, a social experience, and yep. I find that important. Two, it is quite literally FOMO, fear of missing out. Like, I just, I'm part of the collab because if I wasn't part of the collab, then I wouldn't be part of the collab. Exactly. So, uh, and that is a crazy motivator. These are cool. This is a cool use of those. We'll get some Thank more close ups later yeah. and throw those into the video. Yeah, I really enjoyed making a, a little power generator back there that yeah. tied into some of the work stuff I've been doing and how I'm starting to see mechanical elements in a realistic ah, yes. environment. So, yeah. Okay, this is kind of the collar piece. It is wearing the uh, antenna. And the reason that's important is it actually goes between the neck and the head. So, that goes on first. And it's a good thing you're here. It might have taken me a little somewhere. more to figure out how to put this together. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait a second. There we go. So it slots in very nicely. And let me make sure all the functions still work. So we got a few pieces here and there that fell off. We'll have to figure out where those go. Yeah. Yes, I'm glad I'm here too. This is uh, the best way to make sure the creation gets built completely. Okay, so that piece goes here. Yeah, there we go. Yep. And then this piece goes, I'm just by process of elimination, should be able to find it. It must be right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yep. Um, I like this little guy. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Figured there needed to be an actual uh, bad guy, per se, so to speak. Okay, that goes right there. Um, but yeah, the choice of purple for this creation is actually because I am collecting a bunch of purple parts to build a Pergil from Star Wars. That's one of the giant creations I want to build. That's kind of one of my dream mocks. Um, and so I have a bunch of slopes in purple that I've been collecting. And I felt like this was a, in, in a way, a great first test of those parts. So now the other great test is whether or not I can actually <laughs> reassemble this. But I think we're just about You can there. get close. I'm sure. Oh, golly. I might just leave a couple pieces off. We'll fix that after the video. Um, okay, so these little doohickeys are just kind of, I, I don't even know the proper uh, yeah. way, but they, they further decorate the, uh, the seaweed. Luckily, it's not necessary to actually build this creation. So if you set it in place, you can still enjoy all the functionality, and then you don't have to hold it. But it can be swooshed, and that's kind of something I... Although we don't know design. yet if it can be swooshed underwater. Correct. No, no, no I'll, I'll leave that to you to determine. That was a great question. Yeah. Yeah, somebody asked that, for those who don't know, somebody asked that on, uh, one of the people bidding on the auction asked that on the uh, Beyond the Brick stream. I think it was one of the designers. Oh, was? Yeah, Caleb, Caleb said, I don't know, that'll, I'll leave that up to whoever wins the auction to figure it <laughs> yeah. out. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. Probably not. <laughs> so you may still have to be left wondering. Yeah. I mean, as long as everything holds together, you're going to do it slowly. Uh, but... Again, that's not really worth risking everything on. So, okay, cool. There's a little swimmer person, and I love putting the arms in so they look like they're actually dynamically moving. Um, oh, you yeah. okay if we leave those for later? Yep. Cool. And then if you are interested, the signature... Where did I stick that? Uh, over here. That's meant to go right here. Let me turn that so everyone else can see. And then if you want to show us around a little bit on some of the, oh, the cool absolutely. features. Oh, absolutely. One of the things that I find funniest about my chosen profession and my um, experience in the hobby is that I am a mechanical engineer and I almost avoid mechanical concepts in my Lego creations at all costs. I like to say Lego is my outlet to build things that don't move. 
And I don't really know why, because Lego obviously has the capacity to move. I wonder if so. that's just so that you, it's like, I do that for work. I don't want to do that for fun. Maybe, but I've been doing it for I don't know. years. Yeah, okay. it's kind of funny. I think it's because I do like the concept of sculpting more than the concept of designing a functional creation. So with that being said, that's the backdrop for, um, I designed this specifically to flip it on its head. I wanted to put as many functions into a stable, oh. sellable creation as possible and just see what would happen. So, uh, to go through them really quickly, um, the first thing is propulsion. Uh, so in order to propel itself through the ocean, the seahorse has a uh, high pressure water intake here. And that spins a couple of gears, which operates a crankshaft and moves a lever arm forward and backwards. That turns into rotational motion again and causes the tail to pivot backwards and forwards. So I'm not sure if you can see it super great at any particular angle. It's a pretty subtle motion, but just imagine at really high speed, that'd kind of be like a little fish tail vibrating in the water and makes it uh, speed through the water. I'm gonna have to look more closely at that. That's something I'm not very good at yet is, is using gears and technique and stuff. And that's a pretty cool feature. Yeah, it was actually pretty simple. You can just see it's uh, um, rotates 360 and that causes the piston to move forwards and backwards. Yep. Yeah, and Boone, Boone was a master at taking uh, circular rotation and changing yeah. to linear rotation. It's challenging too, especially when you're trying to work in a tight tolerance area. And the biggest challenge was that mechanism took up the core. And so I had to somehow build the structure up around it in order to allow the function to not get in the way of me building up yeah. and actually adding the head onto the seahorse. So yeah. that was certainly probably the most fun one to design. Um, a slightly simpler one uses a very weird part, which I'm sure you've seen before, but it's like, uh, it's a technic element that um, comes together at a, like a 300 or 180 degree free rotating bearing. And so I used those right up here in the, um, in the forehead of the creature. And when I rotate the gear, those allow for a uh, translation of the 40 rotation at a 45 degree angle, which then rotates the eyeball. Oh, that's so cool. And so that was actually really fun that that worked out. I didn't think it would work. And I think you said that that seahorses can actually rotate their eyeballs individually. independently. Yeah. yeah. So that I figured that was important to add. Thank yeah. you for bringing that yeah. up. Yeah. Now this seahorse mech's primary purpose is to save and defend seahorses in the ocean. And seahorses sadly are one of the most uh, susceptible creatures to the fishing industry. They're sort of a collabor um, cl collateral damage where seahorses like to grab onto things with their tails. And so nets provide tons of opportunity to latch onto and drift through water with. And because of that, seahorses end up dying because they get pulled out of the water and drown in the air. So this uh, seahorse is designed to free seahorses from um, nets by this extensible buzz saw in the tail. So the tail folds down when it goes into combat mode and the seahorse can fly up to the net and uh, spin and uh, cut the net and free the seahorse. And, and that was where I, I, why I asked the question of, you know, how much did you know about sea life and stuff? Because you mentioned on the stream that, you know, that they, they get off and get caught in fishing nets. Yeah. And I, I wasn't aware of that, it's unfortunate, but that's, that's a cool feature to have in here. Yeah, in researching this, I researched what the most endangered, um, or one of the most endangered ocean species was. So I did learn a lot. Uh, building this creation. Oh, did you get these? These are like, <laughs> I gotta remember there's a camera here, but these one by one purple bricks with the glitter in them. Did you get those off the pick -a I did. Yeah. yeah, those were on the wall, I think earlier this year. Yep. And I'm going, how am I gonna, I have a few of those, like, what am I gonna use them for? Well, <laughs> yeah, I got a few too many, but it they definitely, it's fun because they, in, in a build creation, I'm hoping to do this in the future, they do that um, pseudo transparent edge to skin really well, or um, flesh, or in this case, scales, where you get a little bit of light Trans or diffusing through the very edge of something. So I figured the edge of the uh, fin would work there perfectly. In the future, I want to use it to line like creatures wings and things. I think actually if I do end up building that pergola I mentioned, it would work really well in like the gill stripes and the seam of the tail and things to give a little bit of light um, coming through. This is fairly beefy. Do you have any idea how many pieces you have in it? Um, I would guess about 1,500, but... There's a lot of small pieces in there, so that's yeah, not, not it, out it of the question. It always adds up quick, doesn't it, the, the number of pieces. But, you know, the base itself is easily 150. Add on the things on the base, you're at 250. Tail, yeah, 1,500 is a pretty reasonable guess. Yeah, I'm working on something right now, which I won't reveal what it is, but it's about 25,000 pieces. You'll get to see it in a little bit, but nobody else will until later. <laughs> but uh, I designed most of it in Brickling Studio, getting back to what you were talking Excellent. about. Excellent, that's cool. Um, but certain things are a pain to do in there, like foliage. Mm -hmm. um, when he went, so I usually don't put those in. And there was another feature on this particular mystery mock um, that used 2,000 two by two tiles, but those aren't in studio either. And so I knew what the studio count was and I added what I thought it was. It's like, okay, it's about 25,000 pieces. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. It is nice having the, the automatic um, piece counter. But the other thing, I mean, studio, since it allows 
free motion of any part in 3D space. It's miles better than LTD. I really did enjoy LEGO Digital Designer. Um, maybe it's still supported, I can't remember. It certainly doesn't have all the modern pieces. But the ability in studio to still snap on, but also freely move things around and create illegal connections is so helpful. <laughs> yeah, I never used LDD. Well, I tried it once, but it was mainly before my time. But yeah. I, I, I like using CAD. I've used CAD for a lot of my other hobbies, and I use Brickland Studio all the time. I even did a, did a video early on that I kind of cringe when I watch now. It's one of my first ones. I need to go back and do it again, but it was talking about submodels, and I love submodels. Cool. Like, I tend to build buildings that have, like, I... I don't remember what it, I built. That one of the first things I built was like a fourteen thousand piece hotel. Yeah, and so it had a whole bunch of window se window segments that were the same, and so I just built them into a sub model and put them all in there. And if I wanted to update it, just change it once, and yeah, absolutely, they're all updated everywhere. Yeah, a lot of people have heard riffing on the uh, um, part or instruction design feature in Brick Studio, and honestly, maybe there are better ones out there, but um, I, LDD didn't have anything like that, and so I find it helpful to group the model. And if you design a model in Studio grouping it initially it makes making instructions a breeze yeah i've never worried about making instructions but i will say who anybody who complains about how it works making instructions is hard people don't Regardless realize how much work there which is to it software you use i'm sure <laughs> but yeah. in order to do it right like you said you really need to be thinking about it from the beginning during the yeah. design process because like i'll have a tendency to work on this side and then come over and work on that side yeah. and that's not how models are built they're built like this so if you're yeah. going to do a destruct instructions you got to kind of build a layer at a time if you want to keep from going crazy to try and make instructions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with that Cloud City, um, LED did have a feature to group things and you could um, hide groups. And that was the most valuable function that I found is that I could go hide groups I wanted and it would automatically allow me to focus on what areas yep. actually. And I can building. do the same thing here. You can you, yep. you can hide a submodel or you can select a group of parts and say hide everything but these parts. Exactly. And that for me is the utility of the group feature in the build process. But then when you get to the instruction process, you're really glad you did it. Because it makes instructions a lot simpler. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been times where I wanted to go back and work on one of my mocks later. And it's like, how did I build this? I don't remember exactly. And I had to go into the studio model and drill in because I didn't have instructions. Yeah. You know, but anyway. Well, cool. This is really neat. So thank you so much for bringing this by. And obviously, thanks for making it, contributing, donating it. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. To the charity. That's... Thank you for your support. I mean, it didn't sell last year. So I'm very grateful. That Wait, so you did this value. last year? This was built for the last year's collaboration. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I put it back up because it sat on my shelf for a year. And yeah. I love it. And someone else deserves to enjoy it too. So. Well, I'm fortunate in that I have had a good career that paid well and I've been able right. to make yeah. some. And, you know, really, I said this to you in Discord, but, you know, the, the real thing is the, the money for the kids. The, the, mo yeah. the, the mocks are just a bonus. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, I threw in you know, $150 worth of parts at least. Yeah. But it's that's... worth it because if my hobby is doing something valuable that I have recently been seeking out avenues to actually make what I, my, um, the art I make mean something. And Creations for Charity is my favorite. Easy yeah. And that's why it was, it was nice that you didn't have to ship this because shipping can be expensive. Like I, I won an auction last year, the year before from Moto. Um, and I think he spent like $35 shipping mm -hmm. it to me yeah. just for the shipping. Yep. Absolutely. But uh, anyway, so yeah, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, we'll talk to everybody later. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be on here. Thank you for the invitation.